Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle once and for all. Fast and Furious versus Mission Impossible. That's right. Don't worry, everyone. We got this. Podcast should have a theme song. Podcast should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Mark, this is going to be the ultimate test of recency bias. Uh, it really is because we did just burn through all of these movies. First of all, we should say hello to the people of the hello world. The hello, people, people of the world. world. It's summertime, and summertime for me has always excited me. I don't know about you, Hal, mm-hmm. because of big budget tent pole summer blockbusters. Of course. I like a small film as much as the next person. Mm-hmm. But there's something really fun about grabbing the largest amount of junk food you can, piling with your friends into a theater and watching some stuff blow up and or get shot into space and or punch through walls and or get heisted and just all those, you know, summer things. And we're here today to talk about two of the greatest summer tentpole franchises of the 2000s and 2010s and 2020s. Still going. both Still going. And we are going to pit them head to head against one another. Yes. The Mission Impossible films, which we have discussed in the past. And mm-hmm. picked Ghost Protocol as the winner as the best Mission Impossible film, if you will remember in an earlier episode. And then the Fast and the Furious franchise, whose tenth film comes out next year, and whom we just discussed last week and picked the seventh film from that series, Furious Seven, as the best Fast and the Furious film. But we're going to be looking not at which of those films is better. We're going to look holistically at the entire yeah. franchise for both. The big arc of each of these franchises and much in the same way that we have compared movie series in the past and assorted things in the past. One of our frequent ways that we like to really figure out in a way to objectively answer these very subjective questions. Uh We've tried to figure out a way to objectively break this down and take a look at it using some categories and some criteria. What I have are six, I'll say, and a half categories. Okay. That I'd like to look at. Sure. And the first of those categories is the storyline itself. The stories that are being told. Movies are storytelling. Let's look at the stories that we are being told and compare them. We've got the Mission Impossible series, which is begins. Ethan Hunt is betrayed by his entire team. And then for the next, what, there are seven of them now? Well, he is betrayed. And he is betrayed. Yes. Killed. Yes. He is betrayed. Who did it? And the, the knock list, which is the list of all the agents is, is be going to be leaked of the impossible mission force for right. those who don't know these movies. But if you don't know these movies, maybe listen to one of our older episodes mm-hmm. about sandwiches. Yeah. Sorry to mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. I interrupted you. Yeah. Is there a storyline that feels more? They're both fairly episodic. I feel like the Fast and the Furious movies ha- may have more of a linear path, though the Mission Impossible movies found their linear path late in their run. I think they found a way to tie everything together really well. And mm-hmm. I think the movie, the Mission Impossible films, because Tom Cruise is still one of, if not the biggest star in the world, mm-hmm. it is about his character. It is all about Ethan Hunt. Everything else is happening around whatever is happening to Ethan Hunt. Yeah. And he now has his group that he works with, with like, like being Ilsa, Luther, and Benji. Those are the main, and Brant as well mm. is in there, played by uh, Jeremy Renner. But it is singularly really about Ethan Hunt and the ghosts of his past and his past sins coming back to haunt him and whether he can still do what he wants to do anymore. I think what's interesting about these two franchises and mm-hmm. why they make a good comparison to one another is number, uh, number one, they both made a lot of movies. Number two, you could argue the quality of those movies has increased over time. In Mission Impossible's case, I think it keeps getting better. Even yeah. even if it hit uh, an, an early zenith in the fourth film, that being Ghost Protocol, that really laid the foundation for Rogue Nation and Fallout, which are fantastic movies. They're great. And they're also those lin- – it is very linear. You're following that one guy. Yes. So it all ties into him and what his story is. 
Fast and the Furious takes a while to get there. I would say it takes about four to five films to really tie it together. And part of that is Vin Diesel didn't come back for number two. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to bring back Paul Walker for number three. Then Vin Diesel comes back and they say, let's get the band back together. Then in five, they say, let's bring all of them in. And all the time, another thing that they both share as films is that when you make a tentpole action film and you do a crazy stunt in one movie, you have to top it in the next movie. You yep. either go real big or you have to get real small. And yeah. neither of these films have gotten small. They just keep getting crazier and crazier in the things that they've done. I would argue, though, that Mission Impossible 3 went small. That was it the thing that that was did. the and, and I would say even looking at the Fast and the Furious movies, I would say the fourth, which is they consider the soft reboot of the Fast and the Furious movies is, you know, you yes, you either have to top yourself or I think you have to get grittier. And that was what J.J. Abrams did. And we talked about this in that episode where, you know, the big climactic scene is CPR. You know what I mean? J.J. Right. Abrams brings it down and tightens things up. Uh, the big climactic scenes in part four of the Fast and the Furious movies is, you know, the stakes are higher and Dominic explodes a tunnel from Mexico to the United States. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Which is it ain't the oil tanker that it is later. You know what I mean? So maybe that one did kind of get bigger and bigger. But I felt like the fourth movie in that franchise brought it back down to human scale and then just rocketed from there. Anyway, I wasn't you know, sure. I'd well, I think I, I also think Mission Impossible 2 was a misstep. I'm not a fan of it. I like John Woo. I don't like John mm -hmm. Woo directing every single thing. And it, this felt like a poor fit. Mission Impossible 3 felt a lot better. Part mm -hmm. of that is having Philip Seymour Hoffman as your villain. Because he's such a fantastic. We've actor. got other categories. We're going to get to that. That but, we're going to uh, go deep into that. I just they they make an interesting comparison to one another, mm -hmm. given that as wildly different as they are, they're also somewhat the same. I will say that there's a formula to each of them, mm -hmm. and I think one of them is way more formulaic than the other. Which and is, I think, fast. Every Fast and the Furious movie is almost exactly the same in terms of yeah. what the beats are, but even more specific. You can say the same for Mission Impossible. It's, it's the mission at the top, and he's pretending to be someone else, and it almost fails, but it doesn't, and then something crazy happens, and that leads him into, into all this intrigue, and then there's a big action set piece in the middle where they have to break in and get something, and then at the end is the madcap battle right. where nothing is what you think it is, and they're trying to misdirect you. Yes. Fast and the Furious is we start racing cars, then one of us gets embroiled in something. It's almost invariably Dominic, something from his past or a relationship of his has been threatened. The team comes together. They're given whatever resources that they need. They do a heist using their crazy cars. Then at the end, they do a crazier heist where you think they're all going to die. Dominic sets all of them free to sacrifice himself, but yeah. never dies. <laughs> he, he and then they have a barbecue. Himself. They always yeah. have a barbecue. There's always a barbecue with Coronas. Yeah, it's the blue bloods of movie series. They always sit down to dinner at the end of the movie. Yeah. Together. The movie always has to end with the big family meal. Yes. One thing I just in talking about the storyline, mm -hmm. the storylines of it, a thing that I think might give Mission Impossible the edge on this is that we do have one protagonist mm -hmm. whose individual storyline we can follow, which gives us the opportunity to have a little more fun with the variables within that. There are fewer variables in a Fast and the Furious movie because they always have to find a reason to race. They all, there's right. always a race scene. There's all there. They have to spend so much time in cars. Everything is based around cars. And those movies tend to be in the earlier ones, especially before they got very much like Mission Impossible and started comparing themselves to Mission Impossible within the movies. At right. one point, Tyrese says, uh, this isn't Mission Impossible. This is Mission Insanity. Like they're daring the Mission Impossible movies to try and one up them. But that's later on. Early on, they've got they, the movie will take place in one city. You know what I mean? You've got. Uh -huh. The first movie, uh, Los Angeles. Yep. Second movie, The Border. No, second movie, Miami. Miami. Third movie, Tokyo. Tokyo. Fourth movie, The Border. Fifth yep. movie, Rio. Like, uh -huh. Mission Impossible movies are all over the world. And they're not just driving. They're doing every possible version of a heist you can imagine. So I think... Right. The story, you know, opera, they're doing these operatic scenes. The, oh, so good. It's a the beautiful scene. So I would say that the edge in this 
in the stories goes to Mission Impossible. I would agree with you a hundred percent. I also yeah. think that the action is motivated out of the stories mm-hmm. in a much more organic way than it is in Fast and the Furious. However, I will give what I like about Fast and the Furious is the same mm-hmm. thing, like a good, a good action sequence and, and look at, at almost every, every one of the first three Indiana Jones films. Mm-hmm. This happens. And because that happens, this also happens. And because that happens, this happens. So there's a logical line that you can draw through the action for yeah. why they're jumping from here to there, why they have to, uh, why he has to tumble a tank, uh, tumble a truck down a hill and then, and then drive it off. Yeah. Like look, look at the entire fight in Raiders of the Lost Ark in the market where he's fighting the, the big, the big Nazi guy in front yeah. of the plane and it gets crazier and heightens and heightens, but everything happens. You can, you can track like why it all happened. You can go back to, well, this happened and that started the plane going and then that broke the fuel line and then that started the fire. Mm-hmm. And then she got in and couldn't like uh, everything. Th- that's a it's really crisp. good way to film action. And, and both films have that done. Both films do that really well, but particularly Fast and the Furious because of how ridiculous it is. You can mm-hmm. still track a logic to it, which I appreciate. Yes. Well, you know what? I This is why you are my partner, my friend, because the next category that I have listed family, the action sequences. Oh, action sequences. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about these action sequences. And you mentioned that in the Mission Impossible movies, they have more. They all have a reason why they happen. Sometimes I got to say in the Fast and the Furious movies, the reason that they happen is because they are just trying to top last time. That has not like there is no reason for them to race on the ice against a submarine, <laughs> except that they're racing on the ice against a submarine. And then, also, and then Roman is sledding on a car door. Yeah. Yeah, he Roman has some insane, insane moves that he pulls off in that <laughs> scene. Does. I think that they, they break the laws of physics constantly. Sure. In a way that I don't Both think films. the Mission Impossible, I don't know if the Mission uh, Impossibles do as much mm-hmm. for one specific reason is I think that action sequence wise, mm-hmm. first of all, the Fast and the Furious movies have to spend so much more time in cars. So they're not getting to do as many, you know, as many, there's much variety in the action sequences, as I mentioned before. But they, you know, they find ways to do it. They have a train heist. The train heist in five is one of the coolest action sequences I've ever seen. But they rely a lot on CG. There is so much computer generated action in a Fast and the Furious movie. There's, whereas there's, more, there's a lot more practical stunts in it than you think there are. Really? Especially the just like when Dominic, the, the, I'm, I'm talking about the moments where they are breaking the laws of physics. There are a lot of times where they will film things physically and then, mm-hmm. and then digitize stuff later on. But okay. there are, there definitely are, uh, there are definitely also sequences where there's a ridiculous amount of CG. Yeah. I mean, the entire space sequence, they didn't actually shoot a car into space. Well, I'm, I would hope not, the, but like, even like, determined. Hey, let's, let's put a car. You know, let's jump a car off of a John Cena jumps a car off of a cliff and then a plane comes down and picks it up like an eagle picking up a yeah. vole. You That's know right. what I mean? Because they have those magnets. But the Mission Impossible movies, uh-huh. you know, you've got Tom Cruise is really hanging off the side of a plane. He's really Tom Cruise loves doing his own stunts. And he he's an old school movie star that wants practical effects. Let me put it this way. Uh-huh. This is a legitimate question. It's going to seem like a bit, but it's mm-hmm. not. Do you find it more well, suspenseful? But, you know, both, I, I think action films in general mm-hmm. or, or action sequences get your, not serotonin levels, whatever it is, it gets you sort of your heart rate buzzed, up. Your heart rate up. Which gets your heart rate up more? Is it someone punching you in the face repeatedly or punching you as hard as they can? Anywhere, your arm, your face, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Or is it being in a room where you're sort of feeling around and you don't know when you're going to get punched, but you know you're going to get punched? Which of those gets your heart rate up more? I mean, I think it's a different version of getting your heart rate up. One feels like action. One feels like thriller. Right. Is there one that you feel 
and there's no right or wrong answer. I'm right. No, I know. I'm trying to, to me fast and the furious is they are punching you in the face of everything that's happening and it gets crazier and crazier. And it's mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Mission impossible. Invariably Tom Cruise is trapped somewhere and there are good fight sequences. The fight mm-hmm. sequences are really good, but there's inevitably a part where he has to scale something or sneak through something. And you're waiting for something to go wrong and him to try to get out. And the first one, it's him going to the CIA headquarters and dropping sure, in. Sure, that very the famous, change, like, the pressure, ooh, all of that. Zip line scene, yeah. Yes. So that to me, I enjoy, I enjoy both, but I, I appreciate it, the, the heart rate boost that I get from those Mission Impossible films. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think there is more. I think that Mission Impossible's already got the first two of these then, because I would give this second one to Mission Impossible as well. I would agree with you, yeah. Yeah. Not to say there aren't some incredible, incredible action sequences in the Fast and the Furious movies. They feel less like there is actual danger because they feel more like a video game. And also, like, Ethan Hunt evades death in a different way than Dominic Toretto does. Yeah. Where, like, Ethan Hunt is narrowly escaping and is able to hold on and climb through things. And yeah. it is impossible, but somehow the internal logic of those films feels like they're sim- – like, they they set the expectation for that in the first film when the blade of the helicopter almost slices him in the neck but stops mm-hmm. just short. Like – that craziness just gets amplified throughout it. From Fast and the Furious, we go from Vin Diesel being uh, a car thief with a code to in number nine, he's grabbing chains and making an entire concrete. Like yeah. he, he throws he's Samson. people like they're ready. Yes. He gains super strength throughout those films. Mm-hmm. And I think that is, it just goes wackier and wackier and wackier. And that's, that's a fine premise. It's not a knock on it, but I think I appreciate the internal logic staying intact in Mission Impossible a little bit more. Yeah. All right. Before we go to a break. Yeah. I said that we had six and a half. This is the half one. This uh-huh. is a little, this is a little baby one that I just wanted to throw out there because there's some really fun stuff in these. Could make a difference. I, it, it could make a difference, but I honestly, I think Mission Impossible's got the edge on this one too. And it's the, the tech. tech? No, oh, the, the tech. tech, because I just wanted to talk a little about the tech in the Fast and the Furious movies, because one thing these producers have done is invent some of the dumbest, best gizmos for specifically for car chases. OK, in Fast and the Furious 2, it's a harpoon gun that shuts off the electrical systems in your car and just stalls your car out. Uh-huh. Remember that they have that gun that they can like now your car doesn't work. Yeah. Then, like, two movies later, they introduce these little discs, these little magnetic discs that you can throw at a car. And then if it hits a car, then suddenly you can control that car. Yes. They can take over the electrical system. Yeah. That's right. You can take it. You can take over the whole thing. You can drive it. You can steer. Yeah, you can do it's everything. it's through the high-tech cars. Like, it's if through the high-tech cars. Dodge yeah. Charger, it wouldn't work. It's, exactly. It's on the more yeah. modern cars that can take over. The magnets. And later, they add the magnets. Where they have a magnet that is so powerful, it sucks a car through a building. Yes. And then they each take a little piece of that super mega magnet and put it in their own individual cars and have an entire car chase where they spend the chase flipping the switch on and off for each of the individual cars' electromagnets, which uh-huh. wreaks absolute havoc on the streets. That's right. But what about the Mission Impossible tech, Hal? I mean, probably the biggest thing is the face tech, the face uh, scanning and the printers that they have that get better and better over time. You have the exploding brain chip from Mission Impossible 3, which he doesn't really use. Probably 4, which is the one that we picked, Mm -hmm. had the most, which is the invisibility screen that he puts up. Which is lunacy, but it's so fun. What's going on, the 3D printer for the faces, the magnetic gloves that he uses to scale the Burj Khalifa, Mm -hmm. and the Terminator contact lenses that let him see... (laughs) A bunch of different information. Look, just the facial stuff. The idea that you live in a world where mm-hmm. a person, a human in front of you can be a deep fake. Yes. Then that in an espionage genre, that all bets are off. Yeah. You know what I mean? I it have to say it's such a huge wide door that they're they don't get too crazy with their te- the screen was great. It's it was yeah. such a good sequence. And they keep trying to get it's an amazing closer sequence. Closer. That that is an outstanding sequence, the great Brad Bird directing that film, mm-hmm. which, I mean, you know how good of a storyteller he is and how good of a director he is. Comes from However, animation. His tentpole scenes are crisp. Strapping a rocket to a car so that it can get through space. 
But before that, they were just get to race a plane. And then the magnets and all of the crazy, the, the other, then they had the harpoon, like the super harpoons that could shoot through concrete. I mean, just yeah. all of that. I, I have to give the technology edge to the Fast and the Furious. Yeah, I, okay. Me. That right. Look, I, I, I think that, this I think that that so is insane. absolutely fair. It's just so insane because they were, they were in a tighter box. You know what I yes. mean? They're also working in a much smaller box. They're like, okay, what tech can we add to cars? Exactly. Or to make car chases more interesting. There are some parts to this where you look at it and you go, okay, well, All right. we're, lauding Mission Impossible for how grounded it is within itself. Mm-hmm. But also, I think you have to give the nod to Fast and Furious in some places for how ridiculous it is and their commitment to that and their internal logic is we're always going to break our rules. Yeah. And the, the technology, I think, is a great example of that. When they came up with that little gizmo that you throw it and if it hits a car, then now you can control that car. I'm like, mm-hmm. guys, this is a step away from Mario Kart at this okay. point. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be one where you can like, oh, you can play the lightning thing and then everybody turns teeny tiny and you can run over them. <laughs> yeah. We're, I'm, Fast Ted is definitely going to introduce red shells. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a quick break. Uh, now that we're about halfway through, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will go through the rest of these criteria and we will find out objectively which is the superior summer tent pole series. We'll be right back. I'll allow it. This episode of We Got This with Mark and Hal is brought to you in part by Trade Coffee. I love Trade Coffee, Hal. We've talked about them on the show before. Yes. I'm a big fan. It is a coffee subscription service, and I have gotten three different wonderful coffees from them so far. Today, I want to talk about Greater Goods. I've already talked about Alma. I've already talked about Hey Shoto. This is Greater Goods, and it's one of my favorites. It's got this sort of rich... You know I like my rich, earthy flavors that make me feel like I'm wearing a big old blanket. Well, of all of the ones that I got, this is the one that felt the most like a blanket. Dark chocolate, brown sugar sort of vibes, and it's smooth. It came to me already ground exactly the way I needed it for my refillable K-cup. They take care of everything for you. You tell them what you want, what kind of coffee you like, and I have not been disappointed yet. Each one is better than the last. Awesome. Well, right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping, when you go to drinktrade.com slash we got this. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash we got this and let Trade find you a coffee that you love. And I got to say how I look forward to what I'm going to discover next time. So thank you to Trade Coffee for sponsoring the show. And thanks for the great coffee. That's drinktrade.com slash we got this for $30 off. And thanks to Trade Coffee for sponsoring the show. Hal Lublin here with breaking news on a revolutionary form of entertainment, professional wrestling. For more, we go to our correspondent, Danielle Radford. Professional wrestling is the craze that's sweeping the nation, featuring fisticuffs. And colorful costumes. But who can help us make sense of this world of body slams? Lindsay Kelk has the answer. Sources tell us of an amazing podcast called Tights and Fights, filled with discussions of the absurdity of professional wrestling, plus all the sincerity and hilarity that you could shake a stick at. Listen to the Tights and Fights podcast every week. Find it on Maximum Fun or wherever you get your podcasts. And your old-timey radio. Hey there, I'm Ellen Weatherford. And I'm Christian Weatherford. And we've got big feelings about animals that we just got to share. On Just the Zoo of Us, your new favorite animal review podcast, we're here to critically evaluate how each animal excels and how it doesn't, rating them out of 10 on their effectiveness, ingenuity, and aesthetics. Guest experts give you their takes informed by actual, real-life experiences studying and working with very cool animals like sharks, cheetahs, and sea turtles. It's a field trip to the zoo for your ears. So if you or your kids have ever wondered if a pigeon can count, why sloths move so slow, or how a spider sees the world, find out with us every Wednesday on Just the Zoo of Us in its natural habitat on MaximumFun.org. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Hal, you ready for the next category? All right, what's next? This is our third category. 
This is our third category. No, this is our, th- third we've done category. two and a half. Third full yeah. category. We're looking at the filmmaking. I'm talking everything that the filmmaking encompasses outside of uh, the story, which we've talked about. We're going to talk about some individual characters. The next three after this are all character-based ones. Okay. In this one, let's talk about the filmmaking. You've got some legendary directors directing the Mission Impossible movies, mm-hmm. each of them coming in in a different style. Yeah. You've got J.J. Abrams bringing Michael Giacchino in to start making some incredible music yeah. for these Mission Impossible movies. Yes. And then he, as a Pixar collaborator as well, mm-hmm. Giacchino returns to work with Brad Bird, which is the best pairing yeah. of the film. But you also have Brian De Palma and John Woo, Abrams, Brad Bird, Christopher McQuarrie. This is like a... So who's a who? Higher echelon of directors by name coming into it. Justin Lin is a is an outstanding director. Sure, he has done a great job. Better luck tomorrow is great. Done a great job. Yeah, yeah, I mean there are certainly good directors for both. I think from a filmmaking standpoint, when Tom Cruise gets involved, there's a certain level of quality that he expects. Yeah, that I think for filmmaking gives it the edge. Yeah, your other directors, by the way. No slouches in Fast and Furious. You have Rob Cohen. Then you have John Singleton directs Too Fast, Too Furious, which is yeah. probably why it's so good. You have James Wan who directs Furious 7. The Fate of the Furious was F. Gary Gray, who's also a very good director. Justin Lin coming back for F9. And then Fast 10 is Luis Leterrier, who's also a great action director. I think he's – it's almost like one of those things is like, how how is he not already directed – one of these films. What else did Leteria do? He did the first MCU Hulk. He did the transporter. Oh. So he's got a style yeah. that almost feels like Hong Kong filmmaking. Like he, he draws his inspiration from a few different places, but I think he's a very good action director. And I think he'll be a really fun choice for this film. I think you're going to see some things you didn't see before. That said, those film, the Fast and the Furious movies are not poorly shot at all. No. I just think that. Mission Impossible is kind of another level. Yeah, it's a more pedigree thing. That th- I had a feeling that that was who was going to yeah. take the cake in this one. So this is now this is turned into if this is a best of seven series, this is turned into Mission Impossible need only win one more category to win the whole thing. Yeah, and I think it might. It might. It might What's win. Next? It might Most win two Tom of the Cruise? next. It might win two of the next three. But we'll find out. The next three categories are all about the performances, and the characters in the movies. Those three categories are the hero, Uh the villains, and the team, or the family, if you will. What do you want to tackle first out of those? I mean, let's go with the team. Yeah, that's there's no question that's the Fast and the Furious. It has to be. Because there's only, like, the only one besides Ethan Hunt that makes it through all the movies is Luther. That's right. Simon Pegg is in like four of them. Rebecca Ferguson as Ilsa is in, I think, three of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, it's it's a different bunch of people every time. True. That's what true. Fast and the Furious does is it gives us a reason to care. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you can't like say, little well, Benji's only in four. Well, Han's only in like four or five of them. So it's, but I will say the family is a much more enjoyable group yeah. of characters. Just the number of them there are. Han is a really fun character. Hobbs breaks a cast off by flexing his arm. Yeah. Then you have you really Deckard love that Shaw. scene. It's so good. Then Deckard Shaw becomes a hero. John Cena becomes a hero. You know they keep adding mm-hmm. to this cast of characters that shows up in these films, and they're all so much fun. Helen Mirren. I mean, just the number, the volume of people. And how enjoyable they all are. So you have the two-hander of Tej and Roman. Like, mm-hmm. pick, pick what you like from the family. And uh, you're never going to be disappointed. Well, and another thing that I love about the family is that mm-hmm. all of them are the most important person in each other's lives. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know if Ethan Hunt is the most important person in Luther's life. Right. You know what I mean? I don't know what the relationship between Benji and Luther is. Right. But I can take any two characters from the family, put them in a room and guess what that scene is going to be. Because, you know, those characters, you care about those characters. They live together. They love each other. They that I had an acting teacher say once you always want. It's always about the who, what and the where. But it's really all about the who. 
And it's all about the relationships. Sure. And that to me is, I mean, it's tough that it's only one category's worth because it's such a huge, huge category. The notion that these characters love one another. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, nothing's more important than family is yeah. like, if you take nothing else from those films, it really is about how important family is. Yeah. It's not about stopping a terrorist or anything like that. It's always about family. Yeah. Both always, biological always, family always. and logical family. Yes. Your, your chosen family. Yeah. And your biological family. Like it's everything. It, it, that is what that series boils down to end of the day. No question. Yeah. So that one, we can weigh that one heavily. We'll give that yeah. one two points. The family gets no, an no, extra no, point. no. Everything gets one point. We can't, we can't veer. How I'm already looking at the writing on the wall, and I can tell who's going to win this. Well, let's talk about heroes. You have Ethan Hunt, Ethan Hunt, and Dom. I'm just, I'm just going the main Dom and Brian. I guess yeah. We have we do Dom and Brian. I would put as the two heroes, mm-hmm. even though they spent the first movie as protagonist and antagonist, but they are, but also cultivating a relationship between the two of them. Yes. That's that's part of it, right? Is there's a relate like, you know, Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze in Point Break mm-hmm. are protagonist and antagonist, but they're also together and yeah. formally. It's never as it's not as simple as that. Never is when it comes to family. <laughs> never. That said, if we're talking about the hero, mm-hmm. come on, Tom Cruise, Ethan Hunt, Mission Impossible. We started the whole storyline segment of this talking about how it really is just the story of one man and his various triumphs and falls and lessons he's learned and ghosts from his past and uh, the future that it, I mean, it is, it is one character. Yeah. I mean, Dom has ruled them all, but it always seems to be like, but it's Vin Diesel doing it who can. No, he's not a great actor, man. There's a reason that when he had to tell this monologue about his dad dying, they had him facing away from the camera the <laughs> whole monologue. Vin <laughs> Diesel is not known for his acting skills. <laughs> I was watching that scene and I was like, can Vin Diesel not deliver a monologue? Is that why he's just kind of upstaging himself and looking off in the wrong direction? It's a big deal when Dominic Toretto looks at you to say something. <laughs> That's a really big deal. <laughs> The rest Meanwhile, of them are like he really yeah. likes that window. Yeah, gosh, he's really saying everything to the void. If Whoever stood, he's talking to is a thousand yards away. I wonder if he can hear him. If I stood for that long, just stock still, I, my thighs would be burning. Well, his thighs are so muscular. That's true. Yeah, from, our from thighs would be burning if we down. did it. But yeah, it's him he ripping down buildings, grabs people and throws them. Like he looks like an angry like. When they show like a gorilla in a nature film, like freaking out, <laughs> that's what because he just grabs people like a beast, like Godzilla, like King Kong, yeah, he grabs them and throws them. Even The Rock, when he does it, it feels a lot more. I mean, but then The Rock was a professional wrestler, so yeah, the fight choreography comes very natural to him. Just there's something about like the brute strength of this guy, of Don. Um, now let's talk a little about Paul Walker because we do have two oh, yeah. heroes in this series. Yes. What I like about Brian O'Connor mm-hmm. is that he is about doing the right thing. Yeah. And as a, in the first film, there's conflict there because he's, he see, you know, a, a lot of these films the villains and for law enforcement, the villains are just named. They're just that they are known only for the terrible things they've done. And mm-hmm. that's why they have to come in. It's their, they are their crimes and that's it. But he learns to this film that these are actual people and that there's depth to them and maybe a little more than he would have thought in going undercover. Cause at first it's, I got to get the collar. I got to get this guy. I'm going to yeah. break up this ring. It's going to be a big deal for me, but he realizes there are things more important than that. And so everything he does is for the right reason is to do the right thing, what he feels is right. And if his commanding officer at the FBI doesn't agree with him, he doesn't care. He's going to do what he thinks is right. And that's an incredibly strong motor to drive a character, especially in an action series. I also, we didn't talk about this last week, but my other favorite thing from the Fast and the Furious films is in Furious 4 Mm -hmm. is his commanding officer uh, in his office 
just has a framed picture of a waving American flag, but it's a close up. It's not the full flag. So it looks like it looks like the flag is one of his children and they sent it to Sears and that's the close up. <laughs> I'd like it if it was the flag and then up in the corner, the flag's profile in like slight a slightly mistier view. Yeah. In that vintage <laughs> Olin Mills way. It's, yeah, it's the flag, the two angle. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there are so many moments in Fast and the Furious where you go, this movie cost a trillion dollars to make. And then there are others where you're like, they went to Dollar Tree to get those things. Yep. You know what? We're, while we're talking about uh, uh-huh. Brian O'Connor. Yes. I don't think that the criminal underworld is terribly bright. Fair. Because people keep winding up trusting this guy. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, no, no. It's cool. He's a cop now. In the criminal underworld or the law enforcement world. Because it's, no, no, no. It's cool. He's a cop again. Yeah, but guys, he has uh, gone from good to bad two or three times now, or he's gone from lawful to unlawful two or three times now. Right. And the criminal underworld is like, no, 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 he's not a cop anymore. And you're like, yeah, today, because he was LAPD in one movie, then he was an outlaw in a movie, then he was the FBI in a movie, yeah. then he was an outlaw again in a movie. Like, yes. he is going all over the map uh, yeah. with his law enforcement whether which side of the law he is on and yet the underworld always seems to trust him and the law world always seems to trust him depending if on which side he is in at any given moment he has maintained relationships on both sides of the fence that he continued to exploit whether it's shay wiggum's character and it's always so great to see shay so in fun any movie but him continuing to come back especially the joke of he yeah. always gets hit in the gut and then his nose gets <laughs> cracked over something <laughs> It happens at least twice. And then I think in the third film, he just has the third time he appears. He just has the injury already. Yeah. But <laughs> I didn't like, even think about that. He's not even. Yeah. He's just permanently injured. And yeah. his, I think his last line of the series thus far is why am I always doing you guys favors? Exactly. It's so good. Yeah. It's what a, what a delightful bureaucrat movies. character. It really is fun. Yeah. But also like, so you have that relationship and then also Brian's relationship with Ted and Roman. Tej and Roman is what brings them yeah. into the family. And yeah. those are from those are from his days in juvie. Like he has a a dark past, but he still wants to do the right thing. Like it's not he's not uh he's never defined by who he was. He's defined by where he is in the moment. That's also a, a cool thing for a hero. Yeah, I like that. But neither of them is Ethan Hunt. No, neither of them are Ethan Hunt. That's true. That's I can't uh Yeah. Ethan Hunt is a much more interesting character in that he can't have a family. The woman he was married mm-hmm. to was a, was such a risk that he had to leave her behind. And then he still gets pulled in to her orbit again. Yeah. And then finally breaks free of that. Like he can only have a relationship in that world. He can't, he doesn't get to have barbecues. I mean, just sometimes they do get together and have coronas at the end of a couple of the movies, but sure. General, I want him to have coronas. I want him to just walk in and have coronas and Dom is in the background at one of exactly. his corona parties. Yeah. They're not going back to East LA to the same house to have a backyard barbecue after mm-hmm. everyone because his job is to be a ghost is yeah. to be a, a person who can blend in anywhere that most people will never have any idea of what he's done at all. So that is a very interesting character to play. And yet he still has to maintain what he thinks is right and wrong, even though he has given his life to a government agency to the point where he can't really exist anymore. Yeah. For those who can't do math, let's do our last category. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And that is the villains. There have been some great villains. There have been some clunker villains. I think one thing that's fun about the Fast and the Furious franchise versus the Mission Impossible franchise Mm -hmm. is that the idea of a villain is so fluid. You know what I mean? There are some people who are clearly villains. Cypher, as played by Charlize Theron, clearly a villain. Reyes. Reyes, clearly a villain. Braga, clearly a villain. Yeah. But there are people in that movie, in those movies, who are villains for an entire movie and then a good guy the next movie. Yep. Both Shaw brothers. Both Shaw brothers. Well, does does uh Shaw the does uh Shaw yeah. the Younger become a good yeah, guy at he, any point? He helps him. He helps him in Fate of the Furious. They work together. No, oh. to help uh, get the baby, help extract the baby. Yeah. Oh right, Both and then Shaw, Shaw and then and then uh, Declan. Yeah, he's out of his coma. Or Deckard in that movie. Yeah. yeah, but Hobbs is even kind of a heavy 
the first time he's introduced and he shows yeah. up. Giselle was a villain who becomes who yeah. becomes a hero. Jacob Toretto is a bad guy who becomes a hero. So I love that fluidity. Just those people alone. Dom me, is a villain who becomes a hero. Dom is a villain who becomes the ultimate hero. That's yeah. true. And then they turn him back into a villain for a film. And then he still turns out to be the hero. Yeah. Again. Michelle Rodriguez, they make her a villain for a little while. So yes, like Led the good guys, while, the yeah. good guys all do stints as villains mm-hmm. and the villains all do stints as good guys. Absolutely. That's kind of fun. Yeah. It's a great way to do it. I love Davian. Again, Philip Seymour Hoffman, great villain. Davian is the one of the best villains in any action movie I've ever seen. The syndicate as a specter like organization, mm-hmm. I think is very formidable, but just the pure wackiness and the cast that they got to come in and play these characters. Mm-hmm. I would give it to Fast and the Furious when it comes to villains because they're just so much damn fun. Yeah. I would give it to the, to the villains for that reason and for the fluidity of it. Family. Yeah. That members, multiple members of the family have been villains. Yeah. Vince, he's a villain in the first movie. He's a good guy when he comes back in the fourth movie. And then briefly a villain, a villain again. Then yeah. he dies. Not like, yeah, it's, uh, it's really fun. So we got to give that one. We got to give the villains to Fast and the Furious, but it doesn't really matter how it does because wow. Out of all of our categories, out of six and a half categories, Two and a half of them were won by the Fast and the Furious franchise and a whopping four to the Mission Impossible series, which means only one thing, Hal. People of the world, nothing's more important than family. Accept your mission, should you choose to accept it. (laughs) Mission Impossible franchise continues to either maintain a high quality or find ways to get a little bit better. Each time, Fast and the Furious gets more and more crazy, and they're lovable knuckleheads. And I will now, after having avoided the films for a long time, and almost like turning my nose up at them, shame on me, Yeah, will now watch any of those films. I will watch them all. I will. I will continue to watch these movies. I will stay faithful to the franchise, because it's just so ridiculous. But... There's just, I, I, it, it's not as good as the Mission Impossible franchise. And it's worth watching all of them. Take if you're spending a lot of time at home this summer, you're going to do a staycation, do a film festival. Watch all the Mission Impossibles, then watch all the Fast and the Furious films. Then watch all of Downton Abbey, including the movies. Do it all. It's worth it. There's so many great film franchises. Of these two head-to-head, though, Mission Impossible wins. Asked and answered, Mr. Hunt. This topic is closed, Hal. But there are many more topics to discuss. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to reach out to us on Twitter at We Got This Tweets or email us at We Got This Podcast at gmail.com or go to our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash We Got This Podcast. Talk about which franchise you love and why. Or if you're watching them for the first time, let us know what you think as you're watching them. I always, I love people getting to discover stuff for the first time. That's always how I feel when somebody sees something that they haven't seen before that I've seen a bunch of times. I very rarely, there are times where I'll go like, you haven't seen that. But a lot of times I go, oh, I'm so excited because I will never get the experience of watching it for the first time again. And mm-hmm. you do. And I sure hope you enjoy it. Anyway, thank you to our producer, Ken Plume, who hosts several fun shows. One of them is called A Bit of a Chat with Ken Plume, available wherever you get your podcasts. The other is Force 5, where people come on and discuss their five favorite Star Wars figures, collectors. It's fun. It's a video uh, podcast. You can check all of that out at patreon.com slash Ken Plume. Thank you to researcher Kate McManus, graphic designer Uri Kelman, and QA engineer Jen Alba. And thanks, of course, to our musicians, Jonathan Dinerstein and Mike Furman, for our score and theme song, respectively. And thanks to you, the people of the world, for giving Hal and I an opportunity not only to sit down and talk about some really fun over-the-top summer blockbusters that we just love, but what he was mentioning before, giving us a reason to, for me at least, also introduce myself to a movie series that I did not know. Um, and to, in both cases, I had not watched all of the Mission Impossible movies either until we did this episode. Um, you always give us a reason to broaden our base of fandoms, be it movies or new foods. Uh, you constantly get us excited, um, and give us a reason to 
get curious about things. And I, I thank you for your curiosity and your support. And we couldn't do this show without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are our family. For Hal Lublin, I'm Mark Gagliardi. For Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin. And don't worry, everybody. We, we got, got this. this. We got this. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.